Oh my goodness, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. At the beginning, if you need help in the Blue Bible, it's on page 1593. You can take those right from the pew and turn there. Today we light the hope candle, and now the peace candle. If you need help getting to uh, Luke chapter 3, just uh, ask your neighbor. They'll help you out. Page 1593. Okay, so just put your finger in there for a minute. I've been getting a kick out of this. There's this, uh, it's on Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and all that. There's this, uh, what do you call it? A person, a handle, a group, I don't know. Um, this page that's called Unvirtuous Abbey. And there's just, it's, just, it's funny to me. Um, let's see, my clicker's on. So I know you may not be able to see the, re the writing, but I'll read it for you. So there's this brilliant bird and with this huge, and I think that's actually a pike. And below it says, actual photo of the Holy Spirit carrying your burdens for a little while so you can rest. Actual photo of the Holy Spirit. That's the funny part to me. <laughs> right? It's unvirtuous so we can talk about pictures of the Holy Spirit, even though, you know, we don't make images of God. This one, this is about John the Baptist. And you have to understand that there's this freight, there's this like meme going around where somebody, does, you see something sort of silly or stupid happen, and then, uh, the person next to it, next to them, is going to do even a worse or more terrible or more silly or whatever, uh, and get themselves hurt, right? And the phrase is like, hold my beer. Have you, have you seen that before? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so this one's about John the Baptist, who we're going to read about uh, today. Um, and so people, you know, the crowd, them, pastors shouldn't be political in the pulpit, John the Baptist says, hold my head. I love it. Next week, I'm going to bring my, my icon um, that is uh, it's painted on canvas, and it is a picture of John the Baptist, and he has his head, but he also has a basket with his head, because uh, John the Baptist, the herald of the Christ, the herald of Jesus, um, said some things uh, about the, the local king, and the local king didn't like it. And um, the, the, the family member around him um, kind of set him up. But anyway, he lost his head. It got cut off. He was waiting and waiting and waiting for his cousin Jesus to do the thing. But it didn't happen for him. And yet, he is uh, alive with his head, also holding his head. The practice of peace is what we're going to talk about this morning. The gospel as practice of peace. And if we look back to the last book in the Old Testament, before there's this really long period of time where everyone tries to solve problems, tries to solve the, um, uh, you know, the Messiah never came, the, the king to rule the earth never came. And so they try to solve that with some of them withdraw and they become isolated and uh, isolated from society and, and think that society is bad and they, they, they study and they have very rigid practices that they do at this time of the day, at this time of the day, at this time of the day. And they think that through this rigorous asceticism that they're going to bring about the change and peace in the world that they want to see when the Messiah didn't come. Other people, they went to the Word. They studied the Bible, and they tried to find the rules, because if I can just find the rules and keep them, that will bring the peace and change that I want to see, because the Messiah never came. And then others, they, they, they went into uh, politics and power, and they said, I can make the change, and, and, uh, and I can see the hope that I want to see through, through power. 
and they became uh, lured into power, and they're the ones who um, eventually, uh, although Jesus died for the whole world, they're the ones who, you know, sent him up the river. And then, um, uh, yeah, that's it. And so all those folks are trying to see the peace and the hope that they want to see because the Messiah never came, because there are passages at the very end of the Old Testament like this. This is from Malachi, the last book in the Bible. I'm just going to read it. Look. Oh, yeah, this is the message. Have you ever read that translation? The message? Okay. Look, I'm sending my messenger on ahead to clear the way for me. Suddenly, out of the blue, the leader you've been looking for will enter his temple. Yes, the messenger of the covenant, the one you've been waiting for. Look, he's on his way. A message from the mouth of God. The um, Excuse me. I don't know why I've seen that. A message from the mouth of God of the angel armies. But who, listen, but who will be able to stand up to that coming? Who can survive his appearance? He'll be like white hot fire from the smelter's furnace. He'll be like the strongest lye soap at the laundry. He'll take his place as a refiner of silver, as a cleanser of dirty clothes. He'll scrub the Levite priests clean, refine them like gold and silver until they're fit for God, fit to present offerings of righteousness. Then and only then will Judah and Jerusalem be fit and pleasing to God as they used to be in the years long ago. And so where is this guy who's going to take care of all of the injustice and set things straight and put those people in their place and get get uh, whether it be the Greeks or the Romans or whomever, get them out of our country, get the oppressors out, the occupiers out of our country so that we can set up in Jerusalem um, our temple with our king who will be ruling the world. Let's do it quickly. And it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen. And then there's this guy who comes along and his name is John the Baptist. And he starts saying things, and then look in uh, chapter 3 of your Bible, please, of uh, Luke, in verse 4. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. And they say, let's do it. He's using the same language as our Old Testament prophet Malachi, and now he says he's the one who's to prepare the way, so get yourself right. He's going to come and cleanse and move out all the evildoers. He's going to put them in their place. Justice will finally happen. People are looking, many people are looking for him to do that with a sword. Like people are doing wrong, and it's causing trouble. And if they would just do right, then the world would be better. Or people are doing wrong, and if we could just get rid of them, the world would be better. Right? These are the types of, of stirrings that, uh, that are going on um, with people of the book. And uh, some of them uh, finally said, well, I don't think he's coming. So I'm just going to do what I want. I'll pursue wealth, pursue power, get the best that I can out of this world until I die. There's nothing after it. Right? That's sort of, that's despair, isn't it? That's despair that leads to taking. When you have that kind of despair, you take from others. That's what your life is about. You're, you're not content and so you take and take and take. Luke does a really unique thing. And to see it, I'm going to read verse 1 through 3. Ready? In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, 
and uh, Traconius, Traconitus, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. You know, this is blah, 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 blah. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so Luke is a historian, and he does this with both John the Baptist and with Jesus. With Jesus, we know that he goes into detail about, right, the Christmas story begins very much like this. Of all the people in power, of all the folks who are known, of all the folks who will be written down in the history books, and who do the angels come to in contrast? They go to the shepherds. They don't, they don't go to the people in positions of power. They don't go to the people who are in the, the high seats. The angels make their first announcement to the shepherds. In fact, those folks who were in high seats who were not Jewish, they thought being a shepherd was dirty. It was low class. It was, it was like physically dirty. You're dealing with death and, uh, and birth. And you're out, uh, out in, the, in the wilderness or in the pastures day after day, no showers, right? They thought they were dirty. Well, he does the same thing here with John. We, we just read all of those names. This person was in place, this person in place, this person. Did the word of God come to them? It did not. The word of God did not come to Tiberius Caesar. It did not come to Pontius Pilate. It did not come to Herod. It did not come to Philip. It did not come to Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests. The word of God came to John in the desert. It came to a man who was living in the wild. Um, John's father, he comes from the priests. John's father is a priest. He comes from the class of priests. And uh, he knows what it's like to be ritually clean, to do the washings, to put this clothes on, to take these clothes off, to put these undergarments on, to put this shield of jewels on the front, and to fix your hair. Like his dad does that for his whole life. And John uh, is out in the wilderness. Um, you know, an angel had to come to his, to his dad and tell him, you know, what was going to happen. And, and uh, he wasn't real thrilled with it. And so he couldn't speak. Uh, until he finally named him John, and then his speech came back when he was born, or about the two weeks after. And so John's out in the wilderness, and he's wearing a dead animal's skin, right? He's using leather. Instead of sticking the fork in the pot like the priests would with a blindfold on and pulling out the meat that they would eat for their dinners uh, throughout the week, John's out there scrounging in in, uh, in holes to get honey. And he's getting his protein through insects, which part, some parts of the world are really ramping up on that again to look at how to get protein, edible protein, out of insects. Anyway, so he's living like that. And there are all these people dressed in purple um, who have attendants and make laws and decrees and they can get backdoor deals done, and they're serving themselves instead of serving the people. They're like folks who uh, eat the meat from the sheep, take the wool from the sheep, take the milk from the sheep. But if the sheep breaks its leg, they don't do any binding up. I mean, isn't, like, we could put, we could put other people's name in here, and I could take it all the way down, you know, to in Muncie, Indiana, the word came to the people on the sidewalk at the corner of 10th and Sampson. Right? That's where, I mean, the gospel does not come from anywhere else except the view from below. And it's shared from the view, it's shared from the view from below with the whole world. It doesn't come anywhere else. It does not come top down. It comes bottom up. And so if you want to know the gospel intimately, you have to know intimately the people who are weak, who society believes are weak, who, who society believes are outcast, 
who generally, in whatever place and time you live in, there's always folks who are thought of as least. And if you want to know the gospel, I'm telling you that the gospel comes through the least to the rest of the world. He starts, Luke starts from the top down and gets to a wild man out in the wilderness. And then that gospel that he's about to bring and share about Jesus, it has to then work its way back up if those folks are going to hear it. Because in the seats of power, you're not often talking about love and kindness and joy and peace and hope. They don't talk about that stuff. Not at all. Okay, so the practice of peace here at Avondale, let, let's talk about how we, you know, the gospel of peace, how, to, how we practice peace here. And I want to let you know that this, oh, that's fancy, right? So this is how am I included at Avondale? What does inclusion mean in the congregation for the church of Avondale? The question and the answer is I'm interested in following Jesus. That's it. You can do membership. You can do other things. But the bottom line is who is welcome in Avondale and who do we pastor and who is part of our congregation, our larger group? Those who are interested in following Jesus, full stop. That's it. You're a part. I mean, you can have just a tiny little bit of interest. You can be here just to see what the scene's like. You know, you can be here for wherever you are, just that tiny little bit. I am interested in checking out this guy. Or I'm interested in checking out these folks. I'm interested in checking out uh, this group. Um, who does stuff in the community. And I, and I read it, but most what's Jesus like? You know? Anybody's included who wants some sort of following, some sort of interest in Jesus as a person in their life. We are part of the, um, the Methodist churches, the United Methodist churches, in the Indiana Conference. And right now, these are... Um, these are our uh, current goals, or our, our current foci in, in Indiana. One is discipleship, and you know that that's just following Jesus. We're going to follow Jesus and make him, in, in his ways, and the way he lives, and his teaching, and his values, we're going to make those a priority in our lives, and see what happens. That's discipleship. And we're going to be involved with other people um, who want to be... Uh, um, following Jesus, and we're going to listen about we're going to listen to teachings uh, from the scriptures about Jesus. The second one, the second goal right now in Indiana in the United Methodist Conference is dismantling racism. Right, these are things that these are things that that John and, and Jesus uh, would would have as as their goals too. I um, I wore my T-shirt today sort of iconic picture of uh, Christ, flip the tables of oppression. All right, it's referencing that time that he, that he flipped tables when, when the Gentile and the women's court for prayer was full of people buying and selling and, and making money off of exchanging money. And Jesus flipped the tables, right? Those tables and those merchants were keeping Gentiles, you and me, we're Gentiles, were keeping Gentiles and women from praying. Because they're filling the place of prayer. Jesus flips the tables, right? Makes a scene. It's like prophetic theater. He does it on purpose so that everybody starts talking about it. Discipleship, dismantling racism. We read a book together, or at least you're familiar with Trouble I've Seen. And the, the issues that we are facing in our country, they're not new, but more of the dominant group in our society now knows what um, uh, minority groups go through when maybe at times before our system kept those issues clouded and the dominant group wasn't faced to deal with what minority groups go through. But that's not the case today. And so that is the turning and the wrenching and the, and the polarization 
uh, that we're going through, the folks who are in leadership, like uh, Tiberius and Pontius Pilate and Herod, their group is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so they're grasping harder and harder and harder uh, to, to maintain power while the rest of the country is growing exponentially um, in minority groups, right? There's a struggle right there. Dismantling racism. And then children matter most. And if you notice, um, Christine is not here today, but we uh, have a children's pastor now, um, Christina, and she started in June, and we um, are working to make, um, right now, deep connections, trustworthy connections with children in our neighborhood right here. That's our only goal right now, is just to make trustworthy connections. Um, that they call her, um, that they stop by and see her, that she does games or reading or whatever it is with them. Um, it's, in it, it's been a little messy, uh, but it, the intentionality is just that trustworthiness would be made. Discipleship, dismantling racism, children matter most. And so, how are, yeah, how are we doing that at Avondale? We're living intentionally. Remember, we talk about this. We make choices as to the path that we're going to take in our lives. But I want you to recognize that you have the power of choice in your life to choose uh, the good things that you want. You are not stuck. And if you feel stuck, there's a group of people here that will help you get unstuck. And so we make intentional choices about how we live. If you're going to follow um, a, a business and corporate world, if you're going to follow a, a trajectory of uh, craftsmanship and um, uh, people who work with their hands, if you're going to be working in the home, right, we make intentional choices because you have the power to make those choices. And if you feel like you don't, well, that's what the body's for. That's what we, we can just talk about and get it all out there and help make some solid decisions for living intentionally. At Avondale, asking for justice that brings peace. We are folks here who are asking for justice. We're asking for justice. Like right now, Pastor Neil's group that he's forming Will is asking the community, the, the city and the county, and the hospital and the healthcare providers, asking for justice that leads to peace. With behavioral mental health therapy, with addiction services, with a center that you will be able to walk in, um, no matter what situation, no matter what situation you're in, you will be able to walk in and receive care. There are no prerequisites, no prerequisites to receive care. We're thinking about how do we do housing first. Again, no prerequisites, you know, no none to have a home, to have shelter. And then what happens when we uh, put folks in houses that weren't in houses? Those are good things. We're asking for justice that brings peace. When you walk into our foyer, you will see um, it's not quite mounted in the wall yet. It's just sitting there. It's a, a sculpture um, by a famous uh, sculptor, uh, Timothy Schmalz. And he's from, from Canada, but his sculptures are in major cities all over the world. And it is a, it's like prison bars, and there's a hand holding in one bar, and there's another one that reaches out from the sculpture, and you can see that it, is, it has a nail hand. And so it is it's portraying like Jesus, and it's called When I Was in Prison. The majority of the people in the Bible that were in prison were put there unjustly. All our Bible heroes that were put, put in prison, that we learned about in Sunday school, that were put in prison, or shackled, or anything like that, it was unjust. It was all unjust. It was because they were doing the right thing. 
And so we recognize that whether you have been, uh, whether you have a, a, a history, a record, a, a criminal background or not, all of us are visiting Jesus when we visit those who are locked up. We are doing it for the person, and Jesus says, I'll take that to me. He identifies with the person who's in prison, when I was in prison. So we have an image of, of Jesus out there. Asking for justice that brings peace. Uh, you may have seen in the summer of 2019 that a, a toxic materials facility wanted to locate on, on Kilgore. And uh, a group of us got together, and it was already okayed by the city. A group of us got together, we did the research, we looked into the chemistry of the materials and how it would be handled. We looked into how the company handled this type of business or this type of uh, facility in other locations, and we said no. And we invited a thousand people to show up at, uh, at City Hall, eight, and, and like 800 signatures were outside in the parking lot, and over 200 people were inside the building. Right? I mean, it's like amazing. And this is an $8 billion company. And we were able to stop them from putting lead and mercury into our, into our air. Putting lead and mercury into, um, into the soil. And then right here's our river. That's the cleanest it's been in 100 years. And they're going to just put lead and mercury. And the, their, their tetrarch, their, um, their Caesar, uh, their priest of, of that company came to Muncie, he traveled here, I think, from like England, came to Muncie and spoke to, to City Hall, and he's on video, and he says that there is absolutely no pollution to this facility. I mean, it's, it, if I, like, if it hadn't happened, and I told you some story like that, you wouldn't believe me. That's absurd that someone would come here and say that. No, those words, no pollution. Right, and so we ask for justice, justice for the people around here who would be breathing that, justice for their bodies and their lungs. We ask for justice for children's brains that are developing, that they don't have to have lead in their system because it's being spewed out every day into our air. Those with, with asthma, those of us who would develop um, uh, health problems afterward. We ask for justice so that schools don't have to have these insulated things around their window in case there's some sort of tr uh, some, some sort of problem or or explosion or, or whatever might happen and release more um, toxic air. Right? We're not going to live like that. That's not peace. And peace isn't just taking it either. Peace isn't just rolling over. It's standing there and saying, no, we want justice that leads to peace. And finally, forming like Jesus. So what are we doing here at Avondale? Well, we actually believe in spiritual formation, that our hearts, our insides, our spirits, our emotions, whatever you want to call those things that are in our interior life, becomes uh, more like Jesus' interior life. And our outside life becomes more like Jesus. He's our example. Right? He's, the, he's the pioneer who's, who's uh, making this course, and we're following um, in his footsteps behind him. He's the cowboy going on ahead in front of everyone else, and we are shown the way by the direction that he's going. So these folks that wanted... Who am I next? Yeah. These folks that wanted... Um, all of the oppressors and the evildoers to be wiped out uh, of Israel. Um, these folks that wanted people to be repaid for their sins. These folks that wanted consequences for people that do wrong. These people who were law and order in Israel in the first century, who wanted, who wanted to set, set things straight. And, and, and then Jesus shows up, and, he, and by the time uh, coming toward his end, he's, 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 he puts himself as the Messiah. 
he's very careful when he says and when he doesn't say, you know, um, just not to die too soon. And they're looking for this consequential, punitive, punishment, judgment, justice. And Jesus says, I'm that man. I'm that man that will bring righteousness. I am that man that will repay sins. I am the one. Right? He goes into all of those things and judgment and justice, consequences and punishment. And he says, I'm going to do it a little bit differently, though. Instead of all of that, instead of all that nastiness, instead of all of that tribulation, instead of people getting what they deserved for their wrongdoings, as if you and I could even, as if you and I could even be the judge of that. He says, let it be done to me. I will take the wrongdoings. You can make me the scapegoat. The world cannot exist as it is because it's not sustainable. Our human societies are not sustainable. It cannot exist uh, and keep going towards fruitfulness and, good, and goodness. We can't do that. There's too much tension. And tension has to be resolved. And it's always resolved with a scapegoat. And so they made him the scapegoat, and he wanted to be. Not just for them, but for the rest of the world. And so all those consequences, all that judgment, whatever you think people should be punished for, he said, I will accept it into my body, and I will accept that uh, 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 on behalf of you. And when my blood sheds, I am identifying with you when your blood sheds. And when my body is broken and cut, I'm identifying with you when your body is broken and cut. And when I die, I'm identifying with you who will die. But when I rise again, I'm going to pull you with me. I'm going to lead the way in the new life, in the new resurrection. You're coming with me. No one else has done this, but I will do it, Jesus says. I will lead the way to the new heaven and the new earth. And here we are again, just like between the Old Testament and the New Testament. When, Lord? When? We're waiting. Some of us are holding up and just waiting the clock out, right? Some of us are trying to uh, fix our life through power and wealth. And again, you can, be, you can have power on a small scale or a big scale, right? Everybody thinks they're better than someone. You can try to fix life with following rules. You can fix life through like, you can try to fix life through being a vigilante. You know, all these things are missing in our hearts. I know they are. Don't act like you've never thought of it. <laughs> Don't act like you've never thought of vigilante justice should occur sometimes. And so we are waiting, and we are waiting, and we are waiting for you, Lord. Come and make this thing right. You've resurrected. Now, now raise the rest of the world. Change it to goodness and beauty and truth, compassion, everything in order forever. As we take communion this morning, I'm going to uh, 